This meeting is now being recorded. Hi, welcome to the presentation. Um, this is a presentation uh, called Managing Medical Zebras. Um, trying to give you an integrative approach um, to managing people with connective tissue disorders, including um, information about the whole person and all the systems involved. Um, uh, my name is Heather Curtin. I'm a physical therapist, and um, you can read my slide for speed. I'll let you read that later at your leisure um, to let you know a little bit more about my background. Um, so next slide. We should be on the slide that is giving credit to the ednf.org. Um, and thank you to the doctors listed above and the um, Physicians Conference. Um, I've pulled a lot of information from those places as well as research articles um, and journals. And there will be a full reference list at the back of the presentation. Next slide. Um, so one of the things we need to keep an eye out for um, with these patients is it's going to be the one in your lobby that doesn't look like the patient that matches the paperwork they just handed to you. Um, they look healthy and possibly young because they might be coming in presenting with symptoms in their early 20s to 40s most typically. Um, and you wouldn't know there's anything wrong with this particular woman unless you saw that she had a neck brace on. Um, so that sometimes biases the doctor to thinking, well, they've got to be crazy because they don't look sick from my judgment. And that's something that's important is to use your first judgment of the patient. They might even have rosy cheeks because they're having a mast cell flare because they're so nervous and anxious about being in your office that they actually have nice pink cheeks and um, look very healthy. Next slide. Um, so uh, why are um, Ehlers Danlos patients calling themselves zebras? Um, so doctors are taught if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not bunny rabbits or elephants. You know, do what makes the most sense. Don't try to think, overthink it. Um, and the trouble with um, Ehlers Danlos patients is from a distance we even look like horses. But once you look up close, it's like these are the ones that it's not working right for. Like everything that I'm supposed to do, it's they're the one percent or the three percent that aren't. It's not working. Um, so they sound like horses and they look a little like horses, but they're different and need to be treated differently. Next slide. Um, so ehlers danlos syndrome, it's a spectrum of monogenetic disorders with a ri wide range of phenotypic severity. So the mother that has ehlers danlos that pass it on to the daughter might present completely differently with a completely different um, level of severity, one being disabled and the other being barely functional athlete. Um, it predominantly affects um, joints, skin, blood vessels, and internal organs, but to varying degrees. Um, most forms are caused by defects in one of the febrilar collagens of enzymes involved in uh, the collagen processing. And recent research has identified defects in the biosynthesis of other molecules in the extracellular matrix uh, and molecules involved in trafficking, secretion, and assembly of the, of, uh, the collagen molecules. Next slide. So for the visual learners, um, we have a cell that makes collagen, and within the cell, if you look at the little circle, um, there's you know processes involved um, in making the bits that then come out as these uh, chains. I'm not very good at driving my laser pointer, which you guys can't see, but um, John, you can kind of draw the chain there at the, the little fingers that are coming out of that top cell. Those are um, collagen molecules. And there's a process by which the uh, molecule gets snipped off. And so there could be something going wrong with the proteins involved in snipping. Um, there can be a problem with the protein involved in linking them together. Um, each of these chains is linked by a lysine, hydrosylated lysine. If you can't hydrosylate, you can't link. Um, so that could be the problem. And so it could be a problem with one of the chains or the second chain or the third chain. And so people can present differently. And that's probably what's making it so difficult to find one common gene that's causing the syndrome. But if there's a problem with any of the process, um, you can end up with a very sim similar presentation of symptoms. And we'll probably know more as the genetic research progresses as to um, which protein is having the problem and then thereby which protein to support the processing of um, as, as research goes on. Next slide. Um, so there's this long list of common uh, comorbidities. And when someone sees a syndrome and common comorbidities, they just think it's another junk term. Um, so uh, they're big words, too, and pretty serious problems. Um, dysautonomia, um, I know I've had doctors tell me that, well, you don't have that unless you pass out all the time, like you can't stay upright. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, a more inclusive diagnosis um, of dysautonomia that we have now than we used two years ago. Um, POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, uh, or positional orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, migraines, um, fibromyalgia. And you don't have to have all of these, but people can have some conglomeration or, or group of these along with having Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, 
Next slide. Um, so Castori is a researcher in Rome who's putting out quite a bit of research um, on Ellers danlos Syndrome. If you Google his name, you could probably find the latest. You'll see some things coming out. Um, so this, uh, this article came out in, I think, 2012. Um, he defined three phases of hypermobility. So it's the hypermobile person in the first phase, typically an infant and child that doesn't really have pain. They're just loose-jointed and can do bendy tricks for their friends. Um, they tend to be uh, geared towards sports like ballet and gymnastics. Um, you'll see a higher density in that population. Uh, wrestling probably as well for men. Um, they will have some symptoms of dislocations or joint instability, especially in the knees. Um, they might have had toddler's elbow as a kid. Um, uh, joint pain can lead to missed school in some cases, but not always. You may not see any pain at all at that age. Um, pain typically begins after 10 years old or right around the um, average age of onset of menarche. Um, so that's interesting to note with especially the female um, hypermobile kids when they start complaining of more pain, lightheadedness, dizziness, um, getting revved up, can't sleep, can't calm down. Um, they have less hypermobility than when they're younger, but still are going to present with greater than four out of nine joints that are hypermobile um, on the Vitan scale, which we'll talk about. Might have joint and muscle and back pain, chronic pain, um, starting to limit daily activity potentially, um, handling objects. Um, can be an issue, dropping things a lot, clumsiness, um, walking more than 30 to 60 minutes. They can complain of a lot of fatigue. Or um, in my case as a kid, I didn't want to go to Disney World because my legs would be too tired. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> and it just didn't, this wasn't worth it for me. Um, carrying heavy objects like shopping bags. Um, and then as we get older, we don't really have an age of onset necessarily that stiffness kicks in, but eventually that kicks in. So now it becomes really hard to diagnose this person because um, they're not going to pass the Bendy score test. Um, so we really need to look at um, historical um, st uh, flexibility and um, mobility and ask more of those types of questions. Um, we, in the stiffness phase, there's typically um, increased anxiety, depression, uh, quality of life goes down a bit. Um, so asking our historical questions to get more information about whether this person is in the group or not. So I've tried to diagnose some patients who have them go back to their doctor with that. Like, I think it could be this. I'm like, well, they're not bendy enough. They don't have it. And so they're not considering, I think, the um, historical perspective. Next slide. Um, so the hypermobile type is, there's many types. Um, the hypermobile type is the most commonly found type. Um, it was defined in 1997, um, and that's when it changed names from type three hypermobile, oh, at a point later it changed names from type three hypermobile type to, um, I'm sorry, from type three to hypermobile type. So currently it's known as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobile type. It's also previously been called the benign joint hypermobility syndrome. There were, um, so in America, the benign joint hypermobility syndrome is the term that kind of took hold and so most doctors know it that way. Um, there was a big push to get the word benign out because it's nothing benign at all. Um, it can actually be very disabling. Um, I did my own little anecdotal study when we did our uh, our awareness walk on the waterfront and talked to all the homeless people about what hypermobility was, and every single one of them showed me their bendy joints. So I really want to do a research on um, going into the homeless population and, like, how many of these folks actually have mental illness and pain and disability that's made them completely unable to function. Um, so, I mean, this could be a really big national problem that, really warrants more focus and research. Um, so there is diagnostic criteria established by Brighton, and this is confusing. Brighton is the one that made the criteria that gets you in or out of the group. Brighton is the one that made the Bendy scale. And so I always remember that Brighton is the really bright guy, and he gets credit for the whole inclusive picture. <laughs> And Brighton was like his, I mean, this is probably really rude to him, I'm joking. But, um, you know, like whatever helps you remember, you know. So Brighton and then Brighton. So Brighton is the, the whole skill. Um, so at any rate, it's a genetic disorder. It affects, affects connective tissue. Um, they've only been able to identify 5% of genes for, hype, for the hypermobile type so far. Um, so that leaves the whole rest of the group, the 95%, not knowing, but seeing a presentation that looks like autosomal dominant uh, pre, uh, past, uh, genetics. <clears throat> we suspect that the hypermobile type of EDS is associated with difficulty processing proteins that interact with collagen. So there's something going on either enzymatically, um, 
digestively both um, where people aren't able to get the proteins where they need to get them uh, to help make collagen. Um, but I would argue that other processes are affected similarly in this group um, by not making uh, pro adequate proteins because as you'll see there's um, a lot of um, psychological issues related to neurotransmitter production. Um, there's what else, you know, uh, metabolic issues. So the making and using of proteins is probably going to um, really come up in the next few years in our uh, genetic research. Um, so the hypermobile type, by its name, is characterized mostly by hypermobile joints. That's the thing that stands out the most. Um, they have less severe skin effects. Um, there is joint instability and chronic pain that's very common. Um, it carries the greatest burden of pain and disability, according to um, Rodney Graham, over other connective tissue disorders. Um, so others, other disorders might kill you. This one will just make you miserable. That's how I think about it. it was, it's not going to likely kill you. And that is actually helpful information for patients to know because some of the fear that they're going to die of an aneurysm or they're going to die of a ruptured, you know, something. It, they are, there can be a group that that is higher incidence for, but generally the hypermobile type don't have to worry about that as much, and getting the anxiety and fear down is really important with education. Um, next slide. Um, so the latest information on the National Ehlers-Danlos Foundation, um, they're saying that Hypermobile type affects 1 in 2,500 to 5,000 individuals, um, where it used to be thought to be 1 in 10 or 20,000, even two years ago they were saying that. Um, Dr. Castori is estimating um, that in women, 6 in 100 and men, 2 in 100 people um, have hypermobility, with 10% of them developing the syndrome, which I would assume means pain, and we'll talk about some other comorbid issues that come up. Um, due to intrinsic and extrinsic um, and acquired contributors such as age, sex, metatype, weight, sports habits, trauma, surgery, diet, pain, cognitions. And so a lot of this stuff we can intervene in, especially in a preventative way. If we know that someone's at risk, um, then there can be some education done um, from a preventative standpoint to prevent them going on to have pain, brain fog, fibromyalgia, and that kind of thing. Um, so the... Um, EDS, hypermobile type, is not rare, it's just rarely diagnosed, is a, a phrase I see a lot at the end of taglines of people talking about EDS. Um, from a um, sociological standpoint, um, we're finding uh, a greater population of Asians than Africans have um, the hypermobile type. There's, I think, one tribe in Africa that 100% is considered to have hypermobile type. Um, and then Europeans are next. So a lot of people from the U.S. that are involved in the U.S. think it's got to be all Americans because that's where we are, you know, <laughs> um, but not necessarily, no. Next slide. Um, so this guy has classical types. This is not hypermobile type. Um, but the classical type is the type that was taught 20 years ago in PT school and in med school. So our seasoned doctors who are otherwise phenomenal in their areas and have all this knowledge really don't know anything about the hypermobile type. And so it's a, a real big disconnect when a patient comes in and possibly knows more about it than the doctor does. And how do you go along with that, you know, without feeling some kind of anxiety in the room, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's why the education, I think, is so uh, critical. So types one and two are classical type, primarily a skin presentation. So you're going to see a stretch sign that's going to be quite significant on these individuals. You can ask them to pull up the side of the neck. The back of the hand is the one that's in the literature, um, over two centimeters of stretch at the back of the hand for classical type typically. These folks will have um, hypermobile joints as well, but it, usually less, um, less pain and less disability, although it's certainly possible to have the whole the whole thing. The vascular type is kind of the big red flag one because these folks have um, problems with the collagen that form blood vessels and organs, and so they can have um, aneurysms at an early age, organ rupture. So anyone with a family history um, of those things need, and hypermobile symptoms probably should be considered, um, although there is a very um, typical face shape that you could Google online. It's a very small pointed nose, um, a pointed chin. Um, and that usually the hypermobility is more in the hands and the feet and not so much in the larger joints. 
And so if you don't see the face type, you see someone that comes in with um, really big plush lips and a wide nose and stiff fingers but really loose elbows and knees, but their mom died of an aneurysm, it could be something different. Um, what the, the doctors were saying is that if there's any chance it could be vascular type and it's one in a thousand that you sent for genetic testing, you should probably send them for genetic testing. But right now, since there's not um, necessarily genetic testing for the hypermobile type, if you really think it's that, they probably don't really need to pursue it um, until we know more. Um, there's other types, um, kyphoscoliotic type, orthoscholastic type. There's Marfans. Um, and so we need to kind of rule out these other types. Um, one thing really exciting is that in May 2016, um, there's going to be an international symposium of doctors doing work in Ehlers Danlos, and they're going to redefine the types. And there's hubbub that they might change the hypermobile type name yet once again. <laughs> For the better, I hope, but I hope it doesn't get us more confused. Um, and I think that might be related to what they're finding um, and genetically. Next slide. So this is a, quick, a quickie on these are the genetic tests you could order. If you were wondering, next slide. Um, this is a, a group that uh, Dr. Franco Mano uses um, to order her tests. These are the panels that she orders for her patients. Next slide. Um, that's another one that she thinks is good. So these are probably East Coast companies, and there's probably something really good on the West Coast, but that's what I have for you. Next slide. Um, so vascular type suspicion would be the one needing genetic testing, um, anyone with family history of early death, particularly with um, aneurysm or organ rupture. Um, a personal history of aneurysm that was caught certainly would put them in a higher risk category or an organ rupture. Um, uh, morphinoid habitus, which is a long, thin, tall body type where the arm span is greater than the height of the individual. So we'll just lay out their arms and measure them, arm span to height. And if it's longer, we say, check, morphinoid habitus. Um, but someone with morphinoid habitus and a positive echocardiogram, meaning they have distension of the um, aorta, the ascending aorta. Um, interesting note about echocardiograms. We used to think the only people that really needed them were the vascular type, but they've been running um, echoes on a lot of people out of the East Coast, and 30 to 50 percent of the hypermobile type have abnormal echoes. But not 30 to 50 percent of them die of a heart aneurysm. So do they need an echo or not? <laughs> I don't know. It might be helpful to get an echo. Somebody go get the phone, just in case we lost connection and they're calling back. Um, 30 to, uh, so the 30 to 50 percent have to have normal echoes, but do you get one every five years just to keep an eye on it and make sure it's not stretching further, or do you do it at a certain age? Um, the average age of death for a vascular type is in the mid-40s, so certainly if you suspect and they're in their 40s, you might want to get one. Um, so again, we'll have, we'll have more clarification on what to do and what the um, sort of protocol of care is after 2016. The plan for the year after the May 6, 2016 symposium is to do a big marketing push to internal medicine and family practice doctors because probably they're going to be the ones that are like tag you're it. You've got to do, you've got to see if these people are in the group or out of the group, um, and then and physiatrists as well. Because right now everybody's pointing the finger. It's not my problem. It's not my problem. It's geneticist's problem. It's rheumatologist's problem. It's the GI doctor's problem. But it's really all of those organ systems that are a problem. Um, and probably the family or the doctor is the one that's looking at all of that. Uh, next slide. Um, so right now the diagnostic criteria um, for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobile type um, is, is valid with over 16 years old, although they're using it at Cincinnati Children's Hospital with kids. We haven't validated it yet. Um, we don't have anything else, I guess. Um, you have to have two major criteria or a major and two minors or four minor criteria. So the major criteria, um, arthralgia for more than three months and four joints. Um, a bite and hypermobility test of four to nine currently or historically. So if you have both of those two, you've got EDS. So that's an office test. That's questions and looking at joint bend. Nothing fancy whatsoever. So I want to empower everyone here. If you're a doctor, you can diagnose this. Uh, next slide. Um, so one point for palms flat on the floor. Um, you get a point for each elbow that can bend backwards 10 degrees. Um, I, there's probably needs to be standardization of how to measure that because 
with muscle tension, like here, I'm, I don't have it, but if you put me here, I do, because I've shortened the muscle. Um, and so that probably needs to be further clarified. Um, uh, pinkies have to hyperextend uh, 90 degrees or more, um, and then thumbs touch the volar forearm. So putting the palm toward the forearm, everyone doesn't know how to do it. They keep going in different directions, but this way. Next slide. So there's your elbow measurement. And then really physical therapists are like the ones that are good with a goniometer. That's like, so like, shouldn't we kind of be the ones diagnosing it or the physiatrist? You know, if you really have to measure it and know how to put the muscle on slack, you know, why wouldn't the PT be the one asking questions and then actually running the screening and then providing the care? Um, so we'll see what happens. That's, that would be my argument if I can get myself invited to the International Symposium. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so there's a, in, a picture of the pinky position and the thumb position. Next slide. And then the historical questions. Um, can you now or could you ever place your hands flat on the floor without bending your knees? Um, can you now or could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? Or as a child, did you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange shapes? Or could you do the splits? This was written by a British person, doing the splits. <laughs> um, uh, did your shoulder or kneecap as a child or teenager dislocate on more than one occasion? And do you consider yourself double jointed? Next slide. Um, so of the minor criteria, um, remember you can have one major and two minor or four minors. Um, the Biden score of uh, one to three, or if you're old, over 50 years old, you can get a zero to three. So that means everybody over 50 gets one point. It's a little weird. <laughs> May need to relook at that. <laughs> um, arthralgia. Uh, and for more than three months in one to three joints, so not as many joints having arthralgia, and then back pain, um, spondylosis, spondylolysis, and spondylolisthesis. Uh, dislocation or subluxation in more than one joint or in one joint more than one time. Soft tissue rheumatism, so um, an epicondylitis, tenosynovitis, bursitis. Um, varicose veins or hernia or uterine and rectal prolapse is all one of those on that list. Get you a point. Next slide. Um, Marthinus habitus. That was a fun picture to show the long, they call them arachnodactyly, so spider-like fingers. Um, and then the upper to lower segment ratio of 0.89. And then arm span to height is the one that I use, 1.03. Um, a walker's wrist sign with the thumb and pinky overlap um, when wrapped around the wrist. And then um, one thing that's different about people that actually have Marfans um, would be uh, that they can't actually extend their elbow past 15 degrees towards zero. So usually the elbow's stiff. That's a really quick one if their elbows don't even go to straight and they're tall and thin. Maybe genetic testing to make sure they don't have Marfans because Marfans can be pretty uh, severe and serious. So we want to rule that out um, if they're in the tall category. Um, next section or next slide. So the skin stretch, this guy looks like he's got classical type, um, two centimeters or more on the back of the hand um, would be positive probably for classical type. Um, Stray, especially at a young age, the young girls that end up with hip um, stretch marks and breast stretch marks that don't look overweight even. Um, uh, thin skin, um, pepperaceous scarring, so it looks a little bit like, they call it cigarette paper, but nobody knows what that is anymore. So <laughs> if you need to see one, I'll show you a scar later. Next slide. Um, minor criteria. Um, eye signs are uh, uh, downwardly slanting, um, drooping eyelids, or even like an older person where the eyelid is covering the visual field a little bit um, and starting to droop down. Um, being nearsighted just slightly because the ligaments and the um, let hold the lens stretch a bit and the muscles get a little over lengthened and can't hold. But these are going to be the people that can read the. Um, the menu in their 60s and not need to put on readers either. So, um, And then blue sclera, so that's always fun to like on the break have everybody look at the side of your eye and see if it's white or blue or gray. Uh, next slide. Um, so it's a multi-system presentation with Ehlers-Danlos and any of the types are going to have multi-system issues. They're just going to have more focus to one or another uh, system. Um, musculoskeletal and dermatological, neurological, cardiovascular, GI and immunological, and that's where the doctors start pointing fingers about who's in charge. Um, and the patient feels like all these different doctors need to talk to each other to know how to best care for me and how is that ever going to happen, you know, and who's really running the show. Next slide. 
So um, this is a funny one, a bunch of doctors with blindfolds on, um, all working on something and trying to figure out what it is. It's a wall, it's a rope, it's a fan, and none of them know they're all working on the same thing. Um, and so we're going to talk about some holistic approaches that will treat more than one system at a time um, and how to kind of think multi-systemic with this group, how different things interact. Next slide. Um, Rodney Graham um, defined three areas um, to think about when you've got an EDS patient in front of you that you need to go, okay, did I, in the PT world, we're tip, we usually do the musculoskeletal pain thing, but I have to remind myself, what were those other things that I need to screen about? Oh, I need to ask them about um, dysautonomia and pseudoneurology, weird nerve stuff. You know, are they getting dizzy? Are they getting, you know, panicky heart, you know, palpitations, um, weird headaches, um, gastroparesis? We'll talk more about dysautonomia, and then GI symptoms, so IBS, really common, bloating, really common. Next slide. Um, so this group in Norway did a incident study of different symptoms with the uh, group. So musculoskeletal pain was by large the greatest complaint. Um, so that's probably what they're presenting with most of the time, but then they've got these other things that are lower down on their list and may not even get brought up but they could be um, windows into a whole other area that needs to be treated to make the musculoskeletal pain go away. Because it could be that they're, it's their gut that's really inflamed and that's what's causing them to have inflammation systemically, which is causing their knee to hurt. Because the mechanics of the knee aren't that bad. You know, if it looks like they're off, it's probably the knee. If it's not, it's like, it doesn't take much for the knee to be excited. excited. Um, uh, so like we said, pseudoneurology and GI problems, but then there's allergy and flu as well. And so um, we'll talk about uh, what that means later. Next slide. Um, so musculoskeletal problems, um, common complaints will be whether, actually migraines probably should be on the pseudoneurology side, not in musculoskeletal, but I would say, um, yeah, tension headaches and that for sure. Um, TMJ dysfunction is in 70% of people with EDS. Um, dry mouth, that actually could be pseudoneurology as well from the fight or flight mechanism being kicked in all the time. Um, neck pain and tension, unstable segments, herniations, um, one of those patients that had three labral surgeries and it keeps failing and three disc surgeries and they keep repeating and failing, um, dislocations and subluxations in the shoulders, multidirectional instabilities and tendonitis. Um, early onset OA, which is also common in fibromyalgia, so um, there was some study done by Dr. Graham in London and they screened all of their fibromyalgia clinic patients for EDS and 80% were positive, which is pretty interesting. Um, rib subluxations, particularly at certain levels that repeat. So we spend a lot of time teaching patients how to put their own rib back in. Um, low back pain, um, really watch out for unstable segments, disc herniations, um, hip dislocations, which in PT school we learned that the only joint you don't have to worry about popping out is the hip. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm here to tell you that it's not true. I've seen so many patients that their hip slides back or forward or both, you know. Um, a lot of hip dysplasia, um, abnormal findings on MRIs where the labrum's not fully formed in a shoulder, the socket's not as deep as it's supposed to be, um, and so there's actual bony um, shaped issues that are going on that could be from embryology um, in that some, some part of that process. Um, patellofemoral syndrome is one of the most common complaints in females with EDS that are teenagers. Um, flat feet or plantar fasciitis, stress fractures. Um, so there's some populate, smaller pop or segments of EDS people that have more bone issues, and there's others that don't have like as many fractures. So again, there's a different. We're going to have subcategories here pretty soon. Um, next slide. Um, so joint laxity can predispose someone to an acute injury, which gets them into a PT office or a surgeon's office. Um, muscle spasm will occur in response to that acute injury or as a means to try to stabilize an unstable joint that hasn't really injured, but it's just sliding around all the time. Um, and then myofascial trigger points develop over time. Um, so treatment with myofascial release techniques um, can be really wonderful for resetting the person's pain level down to a more normal level or acupuncturists in the room come in handy too because there's a lot of resetting that happens in acupuncture as well. Um, nerve impingement uh, can happen from disc disease or joint laxity as well, causing muscle spasm and neuropathic pain. Um, next slide. 
um, from a neuromuscular standpoint. Um, proprioception tends to be poor, so the stretch reflex that occurs in the ligaments in the capsule doesn't really happen because the ligament never hits its stress point unless they're way, 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 way at the end of their range. Um, and so they don't ever get the feedback about to subtle corrections that are supposed to be made about posture, so the patient ends up hanging out at way end range and locking their joints. And so, you know, it's some of the problem from locking the joint, um, possibly. Um, but you'll see clumsiness. Um, I've been playing soccer for a really, really long time. I'm still not that good at it. <laughs> I really like it, but it's like that's what I'm, I'm blaming it on EDS. It's not lack of practice. Um, but easy to get injuries, too. Um, so pediatrics, you're going to see late walkers, maybe someone that skips crawling altogether because there's just not the proprioceptive feedback. You'll see um, sensory processing disorder really, really commonly in this group because um, they just don't really know where they are in space. Um, and so I encourage my adult patients to treat themselves like a kid with sensory processing disorder and swaddle themselves and go in a hammock and swing and put your legs up and be on a hard floor so you can feel where you are and be grounded, kind of some of those things you would do with a um, – with an infant to calm them or go outside and get fresh air, that kind of thing. Um, there's going to be poor balance, so this becomes more of an issue as we get older and um, the balance centers are degenerating anyway and the, the body might be stiffening and not quite as good. The reflexes aren't quite as fast. Um, there's uh, reduced sensation and muscle weakness in some patients, uh, a little more propensity for peripheral neuropathy. The nerve has got connective tissue in and around it, so it can tear um, more easily as well and become more become damaged. Um, uh, there's an increase uh, in pain sensitivity and reactivity could be associated with uh, differences in the brain, actually. So Castore noted that there's larger amygdalas and smaller anterior cingulate and parietal lobes. So the amygdala is the deep brain part that's more the that reflexive fight or flight. So some of the thought is that, you know, 70% of EDS people are stuck in fight or flight and 30% are stuck in rest and digest. <laughs> So some are stuck in both. There's actually a great um, presentation by Dr. Prosinki where they actually monitored and they could see fight or flight and rest and digest neurons firing at the exact same time at full board. Talk about confusing. It's like, no wonder you have IBS. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so then other things, like these are weird things, I would say, but they occur rarely in the normal population and not as rarely in the EDS population. Not everybody has this, but these are things that you might consider ruling out with a patient that's got real severe symptoms that aren't responding to the usual EDS treatment um, because there could be uh, instability with the, where the head is on flipping on C1, you know, and any, that's a huge threat to your, your, your life, right? So every single bit of you is going to go into fight or flight, even if you're not aware that it's flipping, if it's flipping a, a millimeter, um, uh, one of the surgeons that presents um, says that it might be worth using that. So it's not a big slip that needs to happen. Um, really high incidence of um, Chiari malformation um, or low-lying cerebellar tonsils. The big issue comes when there's um, uh, flow issues. And so um, the neurologist that presents talks about what to look for, what kind of angles to look for in an MRI to show whether there's actually enough flow around that or whether it's not the issue. Because you might see all EDS people a little bit lower than the average bear in upright MRIs um, where they're hanging lower, but um, not causing necessarily flow issues for everybody. But someone that's got headaches that are, that are not responding to anything, that would probably be something to look at, especially if it's ruining their life. Um, it's something that can potentially be helped. Um, spondylolisthesis is really common in our female teenage dancers. Um, so look out for that. Um, tethered cord syndrome has got a much higher incidence as well. So there's some thought that maybe the nervous system is more stimulated because it's attached and it's getting yanked on all the time, or it's sagging and it's getting banged against the skull all the time, or there's a joint that's getting bumped um, from a loose uh, segment somewhere along the way. There's a lot of segments in the spine that could potentially slip around and bump, um, or you cyst de developing in the, um, in the dura as well, um, uh, causing pulling and irritation. Next slide. Um, so all of those things could potentially cause dysautonomia. Um, so those are things to keep in mind to rule out if, if this person really seems to be in the dysautonomia category, and that's their big, big presenting problem. Um, but there's other um, other things like just sleep disturbances that could cause this. Um, if you sleep deprive a military private in a study, like most of them showed signs of fibromyalgia within a week. So. Um, 
sleep deprivation is a huge problem. So addressing that with um, sleep hygiene education, um, potentially medication, um, biocognitive behavioral, because the more you worry about not getting enough sleep, the more you're not going to sleep. <laughs> You know, so a lot of times I'll just tell my patients that most people in sleep studies think they were awake the whole time when they actually did get some sleep. It just wasn't deep sleep. So I just try to say, you're probably actually asleep when you're thinking about sleeping. And then they'll go, oh, really? I'm like, yes, really? And then calm down. So that was my trick. It worked for me. Now I sleep like a baby. So um, so sometimes information is helpful. So um, postural or static tachycardic syndrome, um, where someone's standing up and they're um, – heart rate's going crazy and the blood pressure can either drop or go skyrocketing, one or the other. But either way, they don't feel very good. They're usually pretty dizzy and at high risk of falls. So my elderly patients, again, I've had a few that we diagnosed just from, they just kept falling every time they stood up. Um, um, neurally mediated hypotension, we're just running low all the time. Um, mo GI motility disturbances tend to be a really big problem. You're not absorbing the nutrients that you need, and you're already having trouble with protein synthesis. You know, now we've got a major problem. Um, and just the bloating can lead to um, increased pain and pressure and muscle spasm and guarding and all of that, too. And difficulty with temperature regulation can be another sign. Someone who's either too hot all the time or too cold or totally swings from one to the other. I had one patient who's cold on one half of her body. Interesting. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so biochemical problems, um, hyperadrenergia, which is a feeling of too much adrenaline. Um, this is a theory proposed by Dr. Alan Pasinke. Um He feels that uh, that's associated with um, low blood pressure. Um, the blood pressure, the blood's not pumping like it needs to, so the heart has to start racing a little bit more, and you're making more and more adrenaline to get the blood to where you need to go. And then, lo and behold, you start having a panic attack, and everyone tells you it's anxiety. Like, but I have nothing to be anxious about. I was just going to the grocery store, and it wasn't like a big deal. I was buying bread, you know. Um, so that can be a frustrating conversation as the patient being told that it's in your head and you need to chill out and you have too much stress all the time. Um, so looking at that as a possibility. Um, so there may be some kind of a mechanical cause of the adrenals um, or at the receptors. Uh, maybe it's the different brain makeup with that bigger amygdala. Um, or it's just the nervous system can't read, the receptors aren't reading the information to balance. You know, I think of it as things are floppy. What's the receptor made out of? Is it floppy too? You know, what? there's something going on probably mechanically there. Um, so it leads to a vicious feedback loop because the more worried you get about being worried about nothing, the more worried you get, the more adrenaline you make. Um, so we can get the other issue happening is that people, these are a lot of times people that were really big go-getters, you know, high achievers that then crashed and burned um, later on in life. Um, they did and did and did and did and then um, couldn't do anymore. Um, so doing too much can actually wear you out and throw your system into a tizzy where it can't hear the information and you're not sleeping enough and you're not reading the information and then you're making more adrenaline, so you're going faster and you can't slow yourself back down. Um, you know, so obviously avoiding too much caffeine or that kind of thing would be important for these people. Um, so, yeah, you do see, and not all EDS people have, chronic fatigue, adrenal fatigue, or fibromyalgia, but you do see that comorbid a lot um, with EDS people, and they're probably getting into it from a route that some others aren't. There's still 20% in the study that have fibromyalgia that didn't show positive, so there's other doors in. Um, but but this might be one of them. Um, so the other thing I would say just by quizzing all my patients and their history is that a lot of them have weird other hormonal or endocrine issues. So it makes me think that it's not just the protein that builds collagen. They probably have a protein channel that has to do with other endocrine functions. So low testosterone I see a lot in males and females, so that would be something to keep an eye out for. Uh, next slide. Uh, Dr. Collins, our GI doctor, um, I love I love this slide, the fight or flight and rest and digest systems, trying to get them balanced. Uh, next slide. And you guys know all the different systems that um, are innervated, but someone could come in with multiple symptoms from each one of these little organs. <laughs> and so they have a lot of things checked off in their box, you know, but they really just want to talk to you about the three top ones, you know. 
Um, so having enough time, and I think patients are understanding if we're if we're good at explaining, like you know, I get 20 minutes with you, so let's pick three and schedule another time. I really want to make sure I cover all this. It's really important, you know, instead of saying, "Well, I can't do all that." You know, it's all about presentation, right? Like, all this is really important. So let's make sure we have time to cover some of these other things, which are the really biggies. Uh, next slide. And this is just another one that's talking about all the different symptoms of dysautonomia that could go, just imagine you're being either too, high, too fight or flighty or too rest or digesty in any one of those organ systems that we just showed. Um, vertigo or dizziness, thirst, fatigue, visual floaters, visual disturbances, um, gastroparesis, trouble breathing and chest pain even. Um, what we'll, I'll show a slide later on that shows the list of symptoms with inflammation. There's a lot of things on both lists. So that's the other tricky part is which system do you treat? <laughs> you know, so usually with the EDS folks, you kind of want to be treating the um, uh, autonomic nervous system and you want to be treating the inflammatory processes together. And then you're going to hopefully hit most of them. And then you can deal with whatever's left and kind of pick it off. Uh, next slide. Um, so mechanical issues with the tissues, um, sinuses can have uh, chronic sinusitis that's causing sleep apnea, um, hypervolumetric lungs, so breathing, being able to inhale too much. So you'll see someone come in with a really square um, chest, um, and the ribs are flared at the bottom, and they're not integrating and pulling down very well. So really teaching that patient to exhale is important, and really building the um, density of the muscles and the intercostals um, with breathing exercises. It's, um, you still always think, well, take a deep breath, take a deep breath, relax. No, these people need to breathe out, breathe out, <laughs> all the way out. So um, you're supposed to have about two and a half to three inches of change from all the way out to all the way in. So a lot of people come in with a half an inch or one inch. That's a pretty typical finding. Um, but these folks have the mobility. They just don't have the muscle coordination. And so training those muscles will keep those ribs in. And those ribs live right next to the sympathetic nervous system ganglia. So really important for them not to go out and bump the nerve ganglia. Um, this group's also really commonly got mitral valve prolapse. Any kind of valve at all in any system could not be working well. So you can be getting GERD and um, SIBO from backup of the um, intestines, the large intestine bacteria going into the small intestine, um, slow gut, constipation, leaky gut. Not all EDS people have leaky gut, but that's a further down the road progression. Um, prolapse of uh, the organs, um, and then other like skin issues. That would be keratinosis pilaris is unsightly but doesn't bother you. Um, thin or keloid scarring could be an issue when it comes to, um, I've seen actually patients actually re-tear a scar from years ago. It actually tore open. So and um, that is more likely to happen when someone's in a situation called mastocytosis, which we'll talk about. Next slide. Um, some surgical precautions. Um, there's this wonderful, I put the link on there, um, pamphlet about surgical precautions that I make my patients give their doctors. It's about, um, it's about primarily uh, vascular type EDS, um, but if anyone has suspected, and they should definitely give this to their doctor. Um, but it's got some really great tips on just the kind of sutures to use and having a conversation about that. It's all stuff I wouldn't know anything about, but the surgeons know exactly what they're talking about when they circle the type of suture in that booklet. And it helps to give the patient a little more confidence going into surgery. Um, people with, uh, with vascular type EDS, there's a significant increase in mortality postoperatively, even in kids with vascular EDS. Um, so really, surgery is the last option for that group, really trying to do everything every other way possible. And if surgery must happen, every precaution must be taken, and a vascular specialist really should be in the room. Um, next slide. Um, so then there's uh, functional GI issues like GERD, um, chronic abdominal pain and nausea, um, some of the other things we've talked about. This one's interesting, sphincter of OD dysfunction. Um, a lot of uh, folks with EDS have, end up with gallbladder problems, and we don't know if that's from um, mast cells that live in the organs and in the um, smooth muscle lining um, that are inflaming the area over time, or if it's truly just it's not coordinating well. You know, that fight or flight system, it's not, it's not allowing um, the, the gallbladder to empty like it should with meals. 
and so then it's getting backed up, and then um, the material that's in there is growing crystals, and eventually that can turn into a stone. So um, having surgery to release the um, sphincter that holds the gallbladder and the pancreas together can be a less invasive option for some of these people, and that can be done um, orally, I think. Um, uh, malabsorption and malnutrition are, is a kind of end stage, really, really big problem. There's some EDS people that are on non, no food whatsoever. They're on a, a supplement or like you know IV fluids because they've got their gut has gotten so dysfunctional it cannot figure out how to digest at all. And the hope or the thought is that if we can keep, you think of a pendulum swinging. If you go way into fight or flight, then you have to go to correct way into rest and digest. And if we can kind of keep the pendulum more in the middle by um, being smart and using our cognitive brain, you know, to balance things that are supposed to be happening automatically, then um, we won't get to that stage of malabsorption and that much gut dysfunction, hopefully. Um, next slide. Um, so the most common GI problems reported is bloating in 72% of women with EDS, um, bacterial overgrowth or dysbiosis, so more bad bacteria growing than good, and in an inflamed state, the bad bacteria are really, really happy and grow well. Um, but it might be that the malnutrition is coming because we don't have the good bacteria to break down the food so that we can eat it. We actually rely on them to help us break down the food. You know, so do you take probiotics or do you not? Because a lot of these folks have SIBO, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in the wrong part of the gut, and there's a debate about that. <clears throat> it's complicated. Um, so adequate intake, but malabsorption can be a problem. Um, and then silent reflex, some of the symptoms would be a hoarse voice, uh, recurrent sinus infection. So when someone comes in with a sinus infection and, a ho and you're like, hmm, your voice is hoarse, you have to take reflux, not sinus medication or sinus flush. So that's a different thing. So think about the valves nearby, what could they be doing wrong. Um, and influence can have that too. Next slide. Um, immune dysregulation. So this could be related to the gut immunity um, and the dysbiosis in combination with the dysautonomia and things not happening at the right timing. Um, patients can have multiple food allergies and sensitivities, um, can have inflammatory or even autoimmune disorders, um, or comorbid, um, gluten issues. So not everyone's celiac, um, but there can be a lot of people that say they feel really bad with gluten, so maybe these are the people that are giving gluten a bad rap after all. So. All uh, the cereal companies should come after us. Um, the histamine intolerance is so someone that um, presents positive to every single thing that you um, test their allergy to, which is really probably, you know, or they're more allergic to the histamine, um, uh, what do you call it, test that you did next to the allergy test, near to the allergy. Um, eosinophilic esophagitis and um, colitis um, and microcytic colitis and Crohn's are also really common. And so we'll talk more about mast cell activation disorder, and it could be that that's what is getting people into this trouble, really. Um, next slide. Um, so immunodeficiency, and it's like they seem fine. I don't know why they keep getting sick. They're <laughs> what, what, why? Um, and again, um, we've got a wonderful local um, doctor that's an allergist and immunologist that, that knows about mast cell activation disorder, um, Christine Salter-Price. Um, she's great at sussing that out and figuring out what is it. Is it an immunity where you're not uh, retaining the ability to hold an antigen against something, or are you, um, is the mast cell activation so out of control your body so busy fighting nothing that it can't fight the actual germ when it comes? you know, what's what's really going on. And uh, finally, autoimmune disorders. Um, next slide. There is some thought that uh, re in recent publication that POTS is actually potentially a um, immune, an autoimmune disorder. And I don't know if they, if it's mast cell or if it's truly autoimmune. I haven't uh, read the article, but I just heard about it. Um, so we know that uh, mast cells live in the uh, connective tissue and the connective tissue is not very good. It's constantly getting yanked and pulled, so there's reason for the mast cells to be constantly thinking something's wrong, something's wrong. We should stimulate and create a healing response, you know, because there's probably micro tears happening all the time. Um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome is really hard to prove because there's not great labs for it. Um, so Dr. Price will use the labs for mastocytosis, and it's almost always negative. Um, mastocytosis um, is a situation in which there's a mutation in the receptor that hyperstimulates histamines. 
um, mast cell activation syndrome is a situation in which the mast cell just triggers easily. It just it doesn't take as much. You blow on it, and it decides there's a big germ to fight or a big war to or a big battle to wage. Um, so there's not they're they're active for no given good reason or without a cause, or just a little too active for what the cause is. Um, next slide. So for our visual people, um, this is an antigen. It's supposed to, uh, the little red ball is supposed to link into the blue Y, and then it stimulates this process inside the mast cell um, to get these little packets of um, chemicals, a chemical cascade to be released. Um, so chondroitin sulfate, uh, histamine, heparin, LCF, NCF, can't read the last one. Um, and there's also secretion of leukotrienes, um, thromb thrombo, things that make blood clot, um, and prostaglandins, which is inflammation. So you, there's a higher incidence with EDS, with people with uh, clotting disorders because of this. Um, uh, histamine sensitivity, just they seem inflamed all the time. That's where all the itis has probably come from. Um, next slide. And so the mast cells live in the um, smooth muscle in the internal organs as well as in the connective tissue, like in the skin and that kind of thing. Um, so there's a myriad of symptoms um, outlined in this uh, article uh, that, again, like a lot of these cross over with the dysautonomia symptoms. So, you know, abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, non-cardiac chest pain. That was on the other uh, slide as well. And so... The question is, if you're in a fight or flight state of mind, could it be that your immune system knows that you are and it go ahead and triggers because your your brain has told your immune system that it's time to get up and go and you don't actually even need necessarily an external stimulus. And so someone that's in a chronic state of uh, hyperadrenaline, you know, um, perhaps is more uh, likely to be constantly fighting something that's not really there. Um, and having all the symptoms um, of being exhausted. So think about the way you feel when you're sick, and then think about something like that every day. And that's your not well-managed EDS person. That's kind of how they feel all the time, a little achy and sore and tired, and it's hard to get going, and you're telling them to exercise, and they're looking at you like you're crazy, you know. <laughs> um, and then they'll feel worse after, too, even more exhausted. So we have to be careful about how hard we push and how fast we push, because if you're sick and you push too hard, you're going to really put yourself down and be really, really sick, right? Um, so that's the uh, best example I can give for how to think about it. Um, next slide. Um, let's see. So osteoporosis and osteopenia, I would say that's in a subset of uh, people with EDS. So maybe it's a subset of MCAD people as well as mast cells can um, turn and trigger so they're smart enough to know where to go. So like if you get bit by a tiger on your knee, they don't rush to your elbow, they rush to your knee. Um, so maybe for some people they've gone to their bone, you know, and then they end up with a bone issue, um, bone pain and osteopenia, or maybe they, you know, rush to their uterus and that's where they go. And so um, the link of having um, like a big psychological stressor at the same time as an injury, like a car accident, is oftentimes the onset for fibromyalgia and for EDS people, the syndrome, which is probably the same thing. Um, and so, you know, having that psychological component where the, where the mast cells are told, go here, go here, there's a big problem here, and now that person's having this chronic this cycle of pain in that area and can't get out of it. Um, uh, so neuropsychiatric headaches, um, polyneuropathy, decreased attention spans is the brain fog part, difficulty in concentrating and forgetfulness, um, anxiety, sleeplessness, um, organic brain syndrome, vertigo, lightheadedness, and tinnitus. So if anyone knows um, a fibromyalgia patient, they'll tell you I have such brain fog today. I, don't, I can't remember what you're saying. Please write it down. Um, imagine giving them potentially a solution to that by sending them to go get some allergy medication <laughs> that's really benign, like you're going to have your best friend ever. <laughs> Um, so, and it doesn't work for everybody. I send a lot of my EDS patients to go get screened for MCAD just to see, because if it helps 20% of them and significantly changes their quality of life, it's probably worth sending everybody um, over to get screened, because a lot of them have all the symptoms. So, and the medication is, um, we'll talk about stuff you can take your whole life, as far as we know, and doesn't have huge side effects. Um, so in the skin, um, this is interesting, um, desert storm syndrome 
is a lot like um, EDS syndrome, um, but they have the um, the uh, hives in the skin as the main feature that pops up differently than most um, EDS people. So um, one wonders if the stressor there was an environmental exposure because there was biowarfare used. Um, and so then the skin was more affected and the muscles went there. And, and it's in, it occurs in 25% of um, soldiers from Iraq war. And so could it be that there's a higher incidence of people with hypermobile type EDS that go into the military to begin with? And should we be screening for that possibly? because um, those people are disabled now. Next slide. Um, Dr. Graham, this is another, like, this is a really good slide that I got in my head. I'm like, okay, what was that other slide when I'm sitting in front of my patients? Like, okay, EDS, and I got to the bite and score, and then you have those other things. Okay, MCAD, which is the mast cell activation disorder, and the dysautonomia POTS, so asking questions about that. So about those, those constitutional um, sim symptoms that we just had on the last two slides. Are you having this or this or this or this? or multiple of these, or many from any groups, okay, you need to go see the allergist and go get that ruled out. Um, and then the dysautonomia in POTS, um, in many cases, will get better um, if the mast cell activation is treated. But if the primary presenting symptom is dysautonomia in POTS and I'm passing out, and I can't, but I'm not really nauseous and I don't have reflux and I don't have brain fog, except for when I'm really dizzy, and um, then I'm going to send them to the cardiologist to go look at that primarily. Um, but there is... This slide was from 2014 where they're saying some people with EDS have MCAD and some have dysautonomia and POTS and some have all three, but not everybody has all of it. And there's, you can get into the door for MCAD and dysautonomia through other doorways. You know, so just having diabetes, you can get dysautonomia where the, nerve, the nerves um, deteriorate over time. Um, but then last year, um, they were saying, well, actually, there might be that MCAD is really what's underlying the syndrome. Um, we don't know that yet, but that's sort of the direction we're going in, is that could MCAT actually be um, what's leading to all the symptoms of pain and, and dysautonomia and all of that? Or should that absolutely be treated right next to dysautonomia and right next to the musculoskeletal pain? Next slide. Um, so this is where we have to think, like, who done it? Who started it? And where do we intervene first? If someone's in, the, in front of you, like, what's the big thing that you've got to hit for them? What's the winner? Um, could it be that the um, neurotransmitters and their um, trans and difficulties with transmission is affected by the MCAD um, inflammation in the brain and you've got such brain fog that you can't kind of think through it all and, and your nerves can't either. Um, and so then that's driving this swinging of high and low, fight and flight and rest and digest. Um, and then that's causing you to have pain because you're hypersensitive to things. Next slide. Or could it be that it starts with the musculoskeletal system and there's pain, and pain is stressful and it puts you in fight or flight, so you end up with too much stimulus to that system, which causes dysautonomia and MCAD. Next slide. Or could it be that you didn't sleep very well, you know, because that's you're not comfortable, and every time you lay, your shoulder hurts, your hip dislocates, and your ad adrenaline's up so high anyway. Um, you're not sleeping, and then that causes your um, dysautonomia to get worse because you can't balance something that's not rested and healed and ready for the day. Um, and then by being in fight or flight, that's causing the immune system to trigger. Um, and now you're inflamed, and when you're inflamed, you'll have more pain. Or does it all happen together? Next slide. Ta-da! <laughs> does all the wheels make all the other wheels turn, and this group of people just happens to have all the wheels turning in the wrong direction? <laughs> at the same time. And so we really have got to treat and intervene. Right now, as best that we know and the best that we can do is to treat and intervene at each one of these areas um, and hope that things fall off. And then when, you know, when something doesn't work, we say, well, it wasn't that that started it and take it back out. Um, next slide. Um, so I love this quote from Castori. It says, the best management program should include drugs, physical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and adherence to a series of lifestyle recommendations. Um, so I can do the PT part, but I can't do the drug part. We can support the cognitive behavioral therapy part by keeping people on track with their goals and really teach lifestyle stuff. But we really have to all work together on this. Um, next slide. Um, so this one talks more about the, 
musculoskeletal part again and the physical therapy part. So um, having pain oftentimes leads to inactivity. Inactivity actually causes tissues to fail because they respond to stresses by getting stronger. And then when they fail, they're getting more micro tears and more histamines, more muscles, and more pain. Um, so I had a lot of patients after I showed this slide start exercising when they were like, I didn't believe anybody, but you explained it. So I'm going to go through in a little more detail so you can give this lecture to your patients. Um, so after um, 12 weeks of immobilization, the bone actually reduces um, its hardness by 55 to 60 percent. So you hear about the um, astronauts that come back and actually have osteoporosis and need to be gradually brought back into a weight-bearing status. Um, the connective tissue after immobilization has less water in it. The collagen's um, altered. Um, there's more space between the collagen fibers. There's less elasticity and it's more brittle. And then the um, capsule ligaments fail at lower loads. I thought that was pretty interesting. So like you're actually going to get injured if you aren't active. And so the big take-home lesson is like don't take your kids out of activities, but probably don't put them in high impact activities, you know, like choose the activity, but really encourage activity because that's the number one thing that's going to save, um, save their skin and joints. Um, and the nerves, the neural reflexes cause um, muscle atrophy from joint damage and immobilization. Um, so just by, um, you can kind of lose that brain body connection or the ability to fire the muscle um, by immobilizing it or by just creating a, some pain that's not related to the joint at all. In the area, that you'll see a, an altered pattern of muscle firing around that joint where the tracking's not going to be as good very often. Um, in the muscle, the muscle fiber um, decreases in size. There's an altered um, sarcomere alignment and less mass over time. Um, the actual mitochondria, so someone that doesn't have enough energy to exercise, I'm telling them, like, we're actually making your energy packets right now. We have to feel a little tired in order to make them. Like, we, if it doesn't feel tired, you're not going to need any more than you already have. So we, our balance is to find out how, amount, how tired to feel and not overdo it and be so exhausted you're set back for a week and you can't do anything. Um, so that's where the teamwork with the patient comes in. They've got to give feedback and start to listen to their body, which it's really it gets so much easier to just block it all out because there's so much coming in, you know, pain here and whatever there, and like, whatever, I don't care. And then there's nothing happening well for that person. Um, so reduced oxidative capacity and increased fatigability. So you're actually be able to hold, you know, the VO2 max goes up over time. Um, in the first um, five to seven days of being immobile, that's when you see the biggest change in um, the number of mitochondria and reduced oxidative capacity. Has anyone done that? Like you go away for a week on vacation, you're like, how could it be so exhausting getting back into my exercise program just a week later? And um, this explains why. Um, but it does come back quickly, so that's good news. Um, this one's interesting. They've actually shown that there's atrophy um, in muscles um, due to pain or even just the fear of pain. So if your patients think that something might hurt them or might damage them, that's actually going to cause their muscle to atrophy. So education, education, education. So teaching, like, we're doing this, we're protecting your joint. This is safe. This is not. So we spend a lot of time teaching, like, how to protect every joint in every situation. Um, next slide. Um, so this is where the doctors come in. Um, uh, we need help with getting some of the medication for these folks that um, help. There's a, a second handout that I gave you guys, which are a slide, which are three pages of tables from the article quoted in the back by Castori about management of pain in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, and it, I tried to sort of summarize this in my own words, kind of what three tables say. Um, but if you really want to know, look at, the, look at those three tables. Um, so SSRIs are the ones that are typically prescribed because these folks present as anxious, um, but they're actually not as helpful as SNRIs um, for most folks. They need the norepinephrine to balance the epinephrine that's going madly through their systems. Um, not everybody can tolerate SNRIs, so then what do you do? Um, uh, so Effexor and Cymbalta or Venlafaxine and Duloxetine are really helpful, especially with neuropathic pain. Um, the SNRIs have fewer side effects than the older tricyclic antidepressants, um, and there's some thought that there's an anti-inflammatory effect on the microglia in the brain. So is it actually helping the inflammation in the brain? Is it actually as a mast cell stabilizer, or is it um, actually providing enough neurotransmitter? What's the actual problem? Is hmm, Interesting question. Um, so if the patient can't tolerate 
um, something from this group, um, tricyclic antidepressants are a backup. Um, there's more risks and side effects with them, um, but might be effective. Um, there's a new medication out called, I think, Savella, which helps just norepinephrine. Um, I just heard about that one. So, you know, there's constantly developing um, new and more specific and targeted um, meds, and the targeted meds have fewer side effects. Um, people will still potentially have um, breakthrough um, epinephrine, so not epinephrine, but like an adrenaline type surge or panic attack or that kind of a thing. So does it make sense to have a Valium or Ativan, you know, for acute episodes in a patient you're not worried about, you know, addiction and overuse? Um, it can be nice just to know that it's in the cabinet, like you can actually sleep, knowing that if you can't sleep, you can get up and get it. But if you don't have it in the cabinet, you can't sleep because you're worried that you might not sleep. <laughs> um, and then uh, one of our doctors that's here tonight, actually, Kathy Alvarez, was talking about she'd heard in a seminar about oxytocin possibly. So that might be some something else to look into, um, which is a um, hormone that mothers make when they're nursing. So... Um, uh, other sleep aids that are natural, like melatonin, um, can be helpful. I think there's a subset of people that react to melatonin, though, and um, have issues with POTS, I think. So you got to watch out for that. Um, you can't prescribe that to everybody. But watch the symptoms. And then there's all kinds of naturopathic things. So any of our naturopaths out there um, will know about just providing the amino acids that build these neurotransmitters. Um, these are some that I've heard about through my naturopath. Um, Great Lakes Kosher Gelatin is one um, product that has um, all of the amino acids um, that are hydrosylated lysine included, which is that one that's supposed to crosslink. So I have had a few of my, like, again, another little subset of my patients that they get on the Great Lakes Kosher Gelatin and they are cured. Like, so there are some people that just can't hydrosylate lysine, I'm convinced, and that's the main problem. So if you give it to them, they're fine. Um, so I've had at least two right now that have had taken the Great Lakes Kosher Gelatin, and it really changed things. Next. Um, so the medication for dysautonomia, um, we have a cardiologist in town who will be leaving us soon to move out of town, and there's probably a couple others um, that treat dysautonomia. Um, it's something that requires a lot of tweaking. Um, and careful monitoring because you can go too low on blood pressure or too high on blood pressure. So a lot of uh, patients present with um, low blood pressure and are put on a medication called midodrine. Um, the natural thing that most of the time is prescribed to try first is to take 64 ounces of isotonic fluid per day. Keeping in mind you don't want to have too much fluid intake. Um, if you are having um, just plain water, you could actually dehydrate yourself um, and apparently drown yourself, actually. So um, I have a lot of patients that are constantly thirsty because they're getting that fight or flight dry mouth, and so they're constantly drinking. Like I just no, I just can't get enough, and then they're getting muscle cramps, and then they're having all kinds of other dysautonomia because their salts are low, and so um, uh, electrolyte fluids is the prescription in that case. And so most of my EDS people, I tell them that you would really try to drink as much electrolytes as you can manage in a day, rather than um, non-electrolyte based or juice based uh, fluids. Compression garments are also hugely helpful for improving um, the blood flow return from the legs. So valves in the veins don't work very well to hold the blood and keep it from going backwards. And so the blood just kind of regurgitates and goes backwards and pulls in the legs. Um, and then that could be why the blood pressure is so low. Um, but some people have um, hyperpots, and they actually end up with high blood pressure. Over, and so you can go the other way around. Um, you, I would really, in that, if you have that kind of a patient, look at the Dysautonomia um, Information Network. Um, it's a wonderful uh, website I'll, I linked to on the last slide um, called uh, dinet.org, I think. Um, and some of the thought there is maybe someone's been low for so long they finally swing high, or they're the ones that swing the other direction. Um, so I've had some patients that are prescribed meds for when they're too high and meds for when they're too low. And so they take their blood pressure, and then they have to figure out which one to take. Um, interestingly, in my, you know, experience with those folks, like, the more they're able to keep it in a mid-range, the less it actually goes out of the range and the less they need the meds. So it could be that it's more training the nervous system again to stay in the middle. Um, and so it just, it takes the medication at first, and then it takes more cognitive behavioral approaches, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then um, 
regulating the heart rate and adrenaline surges with beta blockers at a low dose, like 10 milligrams of propanolol. Um, what I wonder about with that, like, could instead of giving some Ativan, could you give them propanolol? You know, to see if that would calm them down. And that's a low acting, you know, six hours and it's out. And you're not going to get addicted to it. Um, it's probably not going to affect the pain, though, like an SNRI would. So, you know, there's kind of a place for all these different things. Uh, next slide. Um, so just kind of summarizing that, you know, looking at the antidepressants, the neurotransmitter reuptake inhibitors, um, nerve pain medications. Do you give a, a emergency medication like an Ativan or a Valium? and possibly a sleep aid so we don't get stuck in the can't sleep cycle. Just go like it's one of those nights. I've had one of those weeks. I know I'm not going to sleep. And if I do that for three nights, now I'm a disaster and I'm not going to go to work. Um, so do we nip that off the bud and um, give a sleep aid for that situation? Next slide. Um, so a lot of people with EDS, lidocaine doesn't work that great on. So we don't really know why. Um, one of the possibilities is it permeates through the tissues faster um, because the tissues are permeable. Um, then the epinephrine that's given with it um, in procedures can make someone go into a, a panic attack that has EDS and is already running a little anxious about their dental appointment or their whatever. So um, using alternatives, um, there's uh, other fluids that can be suspended in um, that make it stay in the area longer. So these folks would probably be good candidates for that. Um, uh, there's a yes, and then for like other analgesics used with other shots, they may not be as effective. Um, next slide. So just remembering that um, one of the things that increases pain is inflammation. So we're going to kind of segue into that section. Next slide. Um, so, you know, NSAIDs work really great for people with fibromyalgia. Um, they do have side effects, though. You know, prolonged use of NSAIDs can be really difficult on the organs. Um, muscle activation syndrome, um, remembering the muscles live in the connective tissue. Some of the medications that are commonly prescribed are um, ketotifen, uh, which is an older um, H1 blocker um, in the family of Zyrtec, um, but it has a nice little side effect that it 